What is up everyone? Your incredible partner in crime is here from the Department of Food Science. Me, Andre. Woohoo! Okay, so in the next three minutes I will tell you everything what you need to know how to use the centrifuge. Okay? Ready? Steady? So let's get into it. Okay, first things first. Before you start your laboratory work, be sure that everything works well. That means checks the socket check the rotor and inside of the machine because you never know who worked before you maybe there is some damage or mess like you did last week remember just kidding or not there is a lot of different types of these check the maximum rpm on the top and middle and remember on these lines we use them for aiming at the rotor changing time if you wanna change this one start with this t-shaped key and turn to the left then grab the rotor be careful and switch for another one. Do you still remember lines? Use them if you can. Then lock router by T-shape key, but in this time turn right until you start to feel resistance. Be sure it works. And now you can see the menu. So as you can see, there is a several important buttons and some not so important, like the program. Whoever uses this one. Now you can change the temperature, rotation, speed of acceleration, and most important, start stop button. And now if you wanna know how to operate correctly, let's ask these two guys. Hi, I'm Roger. And I'm Shukri. And we're going to show you some of the basic steps of centrifugation. When centrifuging samples, there are some basic steps to follow. First, check that the centrifuge is clean and ready to use. Switch on, open the lid, and make sure that the rotor spins freely. If using a rotor with swing-out buckets, check that they swing easily. Next, Choose appropriate adapters for the tubes you are planning to use. And when loading your samples into the rotor, make sure that they are balanced, with the tubes on opposite sides of the rotor having the same weight and volume. Check your protocol and risk assessment, and if required, fit lids onto the buckets to contain any spillages and prevent contaminating the centrifuge. You're now ready to set the centrifuge controls to start. Some protocols refer to spinning samples at a specific speed or RPM, which stands for revolutions per minute, while some refer to spinning at a specific G-force or RCF, which stands for relative centrifugal force. And this is measured in a number times the force of gravity. For example, 1000 G is 1000 times the force of gravity. If a protocol refers to RPM, it should also name the type and size of the centrifuge to be used, since the g-force generated during spinning will be quite different for a given RPM setting in a small centrifuge when compared to a large centrifuge. This could be very important if samples are being processed for the same clinical trial in many different centres where each laboratory has a different type of centrifuge. If the protocol requires the centrifuge to be set at a certain g-force, and this can be done on the controls, then do so. However, if your centrifuge can only be set at RPM, it will be necessary to calculate what speed to use. This can easily be done by measuring the radius of the rotor, i.e. measuring the length from the center of the rotor to where the bottom of the tubes are when the rotor is spinning. This measurement can then be used on the conversion graph to convert RPM to RCF. Okay, in the end, just few tips and tricks. Uh, first of all, maintenance. Remember, occasionally use grease to lubricate the pins at the swinging rotor. Then, don't put vials in the bigger test tubes. Once I did, half of my samples were destroyed on the bottom because of speed. Don't make the same mistakes. And yes, remember that there is no space for mistakes, because every time you break something, I'm immediately forced to shoot a film like this in the language that I never learned in basic or high school. So please, don't let me do this again. Thank you.